Hello Vineyard, so good to uh, be with you through your screen again. Uh, whenever or wherever you're watching this, hello to you and, uh, and God bless. Thank you so much. Some of you are watching this uh, from home who would rather be at church uh, actually, but because we have limited numbers, up to 30 people only uh, per service and we have two services yeah, to disappoint some people and so thank you for uh, uh, your sacrifice by uh, by staying at home i hope you're you're doing well and i hope that uh, what i'm preaching uh, today will uh, will really benefit you we are living in such strange times and there's so much going around and there's so many opinions flying around and i'm just praying that we as a church may be uh, humble in this whole situation maybe uh, full of, of, of love and sacrifice for, to, to help others to, to stay safe and to stay healthy and that we will be patient uh, for when this is all going to be over. Um, I really hope that in the, in the next year we'll be able to meet normally again uh, with everyone singing God's praises aloud together and we can give each other a hug and everything uh, but it's a year of, of patience, it's a year of sacrifice for a lot of us a year of loss as well but I do believe that uh, we're gonna get through this together and that God is doing something beautiful in the midst of all this so let's keep on looking uh, upwards and um, uh, expect God to do something new uh, in our church in our own lives uh, even through this uh, through this crisis hey uh, we are in a series on the Sermon on the Mount and we're moving from chapter 5 to chapter 6 uh, today where Jesus continues his discourse about what it means to live and anticipate uh, the kingdom and it's another exciting passage today we're going to discuss the first 18 chapters uh, uh, 18 verses of chapter 6 and it's another uh, yeah, beautiful and and impactful teaching uh, of Jesus. I'm going to start off with the first uh, verse, pause on that for a little bit because Jesus really sets out uh, what he wants to say in that uh, in the first verse. It goes like this, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now, this opens the whole argument for Jesus about how we should live. And I just want to highlight two, uh, two words out of this one verse uh, before we continue uh, with the examples that Jesus gives to uh, further uh, explain what he tries to say here. Uh, and these two uh, words, the first one is uh, diakosune. Now that's a Greek word, don't be confused if you don't know that. The uh, Diakosune is the word that's translated as uh, righteousness or living righteously. And this word really meant something in, uh, in the first century and even before that, uh, both in the Jewish world uh, and in the Greek world of the, of the philosophers. Uh, one of the main things that they were discussing and thinking about, philosophizing about was how to live correctly, how to live right. What is, the, what is the right way to live? What does that look like? What does that contain? And so it's not only the Jews that were th uh, thinking about that, of course, we read a lot about that in, uh, in Scripture, but also the, the Greek philosophers, uh, this word diakosune really meant something for them. Uh, philosophers from centuries before Jesus, like Plato and Aristotle, they would discuss what this would mean and what this would look like. You know, interesting is that um, Aristotle, who was actually a um, student of Plato, uh, changed the word uh, in discussing this matter from diakosune, from living righteously or even true inner goodness, to the word arete, which means virtue. And this is an important change. And actually the word virtue um, withstood the test of time uh, a lot better than, um, than righteousness, than, than true inner goodness. Uh, and even in the Jewish world, they were talking more about virtue than about righteousness. However, Jesus and the New Testament very much prefer righteousness, diakosune, above uh, virtue. Why is that? We should not underestimate how big this change actually is, because it really changes uh, the emphasis on what it means to live correctly uh, from a matter of the heart to a matter of behavior. Diakosune is about true inner goodness. Arete, virtue, is about 
what other people see. It's, it's, it's more focused on behavior. So it's a shift from heart to behavior. You could say it's a shift from the inner world to the outer world. And taking a little bit further, this could um, even make a shift from authenticity to performance. What Jesus is after is the heart. He is speaking about our motivation behind our behavior here. And that's why this message is called Motivation Matters. <clears throat> Diakosune, righteousness, living righteously, uh, the, the right way of living or even true inner goodness is a matter of the heart first and of behavior second. True inner righteousness, according to the New Testament, is about coming into right standing with God and living your life to glorify the Creator. And this is why righteousness can only really happen after believing in Jesus Christ, after our sins, our unrighteousness being forgiven uh, through faith about what Jesus did on the cross and His resurrection, because then we, can, we come into right standing with God and He changes our heart and that, um, as a result of that, our behavior also changes. So it's a change that happens from the inside out. Now, the second word I want to highlight before, before we continue is in order to. And that's really a key phrase to understand what Jesus tries to say here. He says, don't live out your righteousness in order to be seen by others. And that's key to understanding this first verse. This gives away the true motivation of the heart behind the behavior that other people get to see. Are you doing it to get the applause, the recognition, adoration perhaps, from, or, and fame from other people? Or are you doing it purely to glorify God and to live righteously in His sight? So the question is not was I seen? I mean, not all our behavior we can do in secret. So that's not the question. The question is not if I was seen giving or praying or fasting. The question is, did I do it in order to be seen and appear in a certain way? Now, Jesus is going to um, explore uh, what, he, what he's trying to say here in three um, and with three examples and they were not just random picks. He uh, chose these three examples on purpose because uh, how we will explain this uh, in terms of giving prayer and fasting, um, those were seen as the three pillars or the three main practices of Jewish uh, piety, of, of righteous living. Um, if you'd ask a first century Jew, what does it mean to live righteously and to, to, to be a good person, uh, they would probably answer, uh, give some money to the poor, pray a couple times a day and fast regularly. And so Jesus speaks to these three main practices in, uh, in Jewish life. <clears throat> Let's start off with, uh, with his, what he's to say about uh, giving to the poor. Um, Thus, when you give to the needy, Sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. But truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret, He will reward you. Now if you give something away to be known in order to be known as a generous person, brother or sister, you've got a problem. Now, the tr trumpets uh, mentioned here were probably uh, symbolic. I don't know if people actually would do that. They would sound a trumpet and then give uh, alms to a poor person on the street. Uh, perhaps some dudes uh, even did that. Uh, but I guess it's, it's more symbolic. And I guess this is where the uh, phrase uh, tooting your own horn comes from. But I guess a modern day equivalent would be uh, if you give some money to a poor person uh, or if you do good for someone, don't post about it on Instagram. That might be a good equivalent for our day. Jesus says the applause that you get from people, that's all the reward you're going to get. God wants nothing to do with it. Other people may be applauding, but he isn't. 
If you want to glorify God with your generosity, then let your giving be done in secret. In other words, no one else but God has got to know about it. And perhaps your spouse, since you're sharing a bank account and everything. And Jesus uses the word hypocrisy or the hypocrites. And that's an interesting term that he uses. It's not found much in ancient scripture, but he uses it uh, as one of, the, one of the first. And he uses it often, often to confront the behavior of the religious authorities in his day. And he often sought out uh, confrontation with them uh, to point them to this. He would say, like, you're like uh, graves that are uh, painted white and they, they, they reflect in the sun and they look pretty, but uh, underneath there's just um, dead bones. And Jesus confronted them with their double standards, with their need for praise and recognition, and the way that they would judge others uh, with a measure they didn't even keep for their own lives. And hypocrisy really was a big deal for Jesus. What's interesting about hypocrite is that it's a word that comes directly out of the context of acting. And this helps us to understand what it means. It's about putting on a show. It's about acting a certain way so that others may uh, receive you in a certain way, see you in a certain way, while that's actually not you. You're just playing a role, you're putting on a show, but it's not the real you that is acting. It's the me that I want others to see, but not the me that I really am. I don't know about you, but when I read the Gospels, I often imagine myself being one of the disciples. You know, probably Peter, who was impulsive and, you know, had a big mouth and everything. But uh, I, mean, I imagine myself usually as one of the disciples. But I'm thinking, you know, Every now and again, I should imagine myself being one of the Pharisees, one of those hypocrites that he was speaking to. Because perhaps some of those things that Jesus is confronting and highlighting, they're actually directed at me, not at someone else. Not as, oh, those legalists or all oh, those people who think differently than I do. They're the Pharisees. No, but what if actually I am the Pharisee? What is the hypocrisy in me? Are there things that I do or say or post that don't really reflect what's going on in my heart? And maybe even a deeper question is, do I sometimes put on a show before God? Do I present myself to God in a certain way, even though I know I can come just the way I am and He accepts me? Jesus moves on from topic of giving to the topic of prayer and this will, this part actually will include uh, the um, the Lord's Prayer which I will skip uh, we've, we've talked about this uh, numerous times we'll talk about it again when we preach on uh, on prayer um, but he's speaking to the to the heart of prayer so let me read the verses around it <clears throat> when you pray you must not be like the hypocrites again for they love to, sh uh, to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the end of the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now again, Jesus points at hypocrisy as something that deeply disturbs the authenticity of your relationship with God. Now, Jesus is not against like any form of public prayer. Uh, I mean, we did it in church. I would, I would lead in prayer, for example, or you did it in your small group. You pray together, you pray out loud. It's a, it's, it's a public way. Um, Jesus would continue to teach the Lord's Prayer, uh, which is often prayed in a, in a communal setting. And it's supposed to be, it's, it's our Father who is in heaven, not my Father. So it's really something that we're supposed to also pray together with other people. So Jesus is not against public prayer. What he's pointing out is that prayer should never be a performance. Prayer is not supposed to impress others. It's 
uh, and when we do try to impress others, he says, God won't be impressed with that heart attitude. The last verse here uh, may raise some questions. I mean, what does Jesus mean with this heaping up of empty words? The key to understanding that is the word Gentiles. Uh, he says, don't heap up empty words like the Gentiles do. And the Gentiles were the non-Jews that did that. But Jesus is not against long prayers. I mean, the Bible says that he would go out and pray by himself for a long period of time. He's also not against repetition. Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he would go out and, and pray the same thing a couple of times. So he's not against repetition. And he's certainly not against persistent prayer. He, t he taught a whole parable about uh, a woman that demands um, justice from an unjust just. And he says, be like that woman. Like, persist in prayer, because God is not unjust, He is just, and He will certainly receive that and, and work with that. So, He's not against long prayers or repetition or persistence. Um, he is against this heaping up of, of empty words. So, what does that mean? He says that Gentiles, the way they pray is off because their whole approach to prayer is off. It's not just that they um, are praying to a different God than the creator of heaven and earth, uh, than to Yahweh. Uh, their whole approach to prayer is wrong. What they would do is they would um, pray like in a trance and they would uh, repeat the same phrase over and over again and just uh, try to do something to please their God, small g God, um, in order to get something. Their approach to prayer was, I'm praying to manipulate my God or to move him to do something for me. And Jesus says, that whole approach to prayer is off. And frankly, this is a, an approach to prayer that can sneak into our prayer life as well. When we um, persistently pray just because we want God to do something for us. But Jesus says, that approach to prayer is off. Just about this Gentile prayer, just remember the scene on Mount Carmel where Elijah uh, challenges the, the prophets of Baal uh, to a duel and you know, where they have to light a, a fire in a, in a supernatural way. What do the Baal prophets do? Um, they jump around uh, the altar. They say the same phrase over and over again, Baal, answer us, Baal, answer us. And they do it for a whole flipping day, whole morning and afternoon. They're jumping around, they're praying the same thing over and over again. They cut themselves with swords just to try and please their God to move on their behalf. Jesus says, this is completely the wrong approach to prayer. He teaches prayer is about intimacy with God. It's our Father who is in heaven. He is a Father. He, this is an intimate relationship that we're talking about. And that's why private prayer is more important than public prayer. I love how, how Dallas Willard um, describes prayer. He says, prayer is an intelligent conversation about matters of mutual concern. Love that. If our approach to prayer is just to get God to do something for us, prayer is just a giant exercise in missing the point. Through prayer, we want to get aligned with God's will more than the other way around. In prayer, we connect with our Father, we pour out our hearts and we seek His direction. Yes, part of prayer is about directing God's attention to a certain situation. And yes, um, we don't pray to get something from Him, but it's that through prayer, we partner with Him to see His kingdom come and to see His will being done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what prayer is about. So again, Jesus point out, points out that your motivation matters. It's about intimacy with God. It's about seeking His face. Prayer is not a performance, nor a way to manipulate God to do something for you. It's an intimate conversation with God. Now lastly, he discusses uh, fasting. So let me read those verses to you. Um, when you fast, um, just quickly, not if you fast. It wasn't 
if you give or if you pray or if you fast, it's when you do. Jesus confirms that there are really good things to do. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, again the hypocrites, uh, for they disfigure their faces, uh, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. I'll get back to this reward stuff later. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your fa face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret, He will reward you. So again, the same principles apply. Don't make a performance out of your spiritual life. Whether it's generosity or prayer or fasting, the only one we should be doing this for is God. And so Jesus says, it's so much better to do these things unseen, to do these things in secret than in public. Jesus is so outspoken about hypocrisy because he knew that hypocrisy corrupts our authenticity and destroys intimacy. God is inviting us to an intimate relationship with him. And we grow in intimacy when we live out his generous heart by showing generosity to others. We grow in intimacy when we seek his face in prayer. We grow in intimacy when we deny ourselves of food for a while in order to go deeper with him, to let go of some things, to grab a hold of the things of God. These things help us to grow intimate with him. And God longs for you to grow more and more intimate with him. Intimacy is the reason why we exist. It's our soul's deepest need to be intimate with God. But when we make a performance out of it, we miss out on that intimacy, which is the reward that Jesus is speaking of. And he says, I hope that you enjoy the applause because it's all you're going to get out of this. As soon as you shifted your focus, from seeking intimacy with God to seeking recognition of others, God tuned out. So I hope you enjoy all the likes to your Instagram post. I hope that, you, that people may think of you as a very spiritual person. I hope that they may be very impressed with you. But you're missing out on the very thing that makes your soul healthy. And that's true intimacy with God. Here's the thing. The Father doesn't just see in secret. He is in secret. He is found in the secret place. He's not found. Intimacy with him and experience of him is not found in the public place where everyone can see it. Intimacy with him is found in the secret place. That's where he is. That's where he wants to meet with you so that you and him can be intimate. So as people of God living and anticipating the kingdom, we live our lives for an audience of one. There's only one person that's looking. And Paul would write this to the church in Colossae. He wrote, work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. Here's the thing, I want every single part of my life to glorify God. I want every single area of my life to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. For far too long we've divided the world up in the sacred and the, and the non-sacred, as if there's a difference, as if not this whole world is uh, sanctified by God. As if God is only interested in what we do when we do spiritual things. God is just as interested in me washing the dishes, spending time with my daughter, driving my car, doing some shopping, etc., etc., as in my time spent on my knees. I glorify Him in everything that I do. At least, I want to glorify Him in everything that I do. You know, one thing I hate most of this whole crisis and everything when it comes to our church life is that we can't sing together. Man, that, that really bums me out. 
I love singing together. I love worship. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a worshiper. I'm a, I'm a, well, I'm a best singer. I'm an alright guitar player, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a worship leader at heart. And so that not being part of our church services, it, it, it really bums me out. And it probably does the same for you. And you may also not agree uh, with that whole policy. I don't either, but hey, let's obey the government for, for this while. Um, and I see a lot of Christians getting into hissy fits about this. But I'm wondering, you know, worshiping God is not just done in singing. And also the singing, you can sing at home, you can sing in your car, you can sing on your bike, you can sing whenever, wherever you want, even with your favorite worship music. What if what we need to emphasize in this time is that worship is not just singing songs to God, that worship really is our whole life being an offering of worship to, uh, to our God. What if that's uh, what needs to be highlighted? What if that is what God also wants to highlight in our lives? You are singing a song of praise by spending quality time with your family, by giving your kids your full and undistracted attention when you're with them. You glorify God by giving up some of your personal privileges to keep others safe or to at least make them feel safe. Lastly, anticipating the kingdom. Jesus confirms that the importance of giving and prayer and fasting when he says when you give, when you pray, when you fast, not if, when you do this. These things are important. They help us to grow more intimate with God. And perhaps there is an invitation to you from God to seek Him in this time when, it's, when our whole Christian lives are more private than ever. Perhaps there's an invitation from God to grow more intimate with Him through spiritual disciplines. I think they have been undervalued in our Christian world for way too long. Take some time to evaluate your prayer life. What does it look like? Is it regular? Is it several times a day that you said, a few, even if it's a few minutes, uh, for prayer? Is fasting part of your yearly routine or even your monthly routine? Uh, what does your giving look like? Is your, do you have a generous heart? Giving is not only, I guess, with money, but also with your, your time and your attention uh, or with your, with your prayers. What has the Holy Spirit been challenging you about for a really long time? And perhaps he's inviting you into right now to give this some more attention. 2020 has been a very, very difficult year for, I guess, most of us. Uh, also for our family, it's been a year of loss. It's, uh, we've, we've had a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulty. Uh, it's a year with so much uncertainty, uh, perhaps with fear. Uh, probably with, uh, with frustration. 2020 has been a difficult year. And the thing is, we don't even know what 2021 is going to look like at this point. But if we respond to the Spirit's invitation to experience intimacy with God by adopting spiritual disciplines like regular prayer, intercession, fasting, seeking silence and solitude to meet with God, simplicity, um, uh, there's a whole bunch more that I, d I don't have uh, ready here uh, yet. Spiritual disciplines to grow intimate with Him. If we do that, if we, respond, if we respond to the Spirit's invitation, 2020 might be your best year spiritually ever. And I think that's what we really desperately need. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you that your word speaks so clearly to us, even today. Jesus, we invite you to, into our lives, that you may change us from the inside out. Lord, we want to live righteously in uh, the sight of God. We want to be in right relationship with God. And from our hearts, we pray that our behavior may change and that everything in our lives may be dedicated to you. That we may truly live our lives for an audience of one. That we only care that God is looking. And I pray that our whole lives, everything that we do, um, everything that we say will be worship for you in our giving, in our prayers, in our fasting, in everything that we do, in our work, in our family lives, in our, uh, when we are in our neighborhoods and everything, that it's all worship for you, that we may see it 
and experience it as well as worship now in a time we can't sing together Jesus, I pray that you'll cut out any hypocrisy that is still in us. That we may grow in authenticity. That we may not be afraid to show others our real selves. And that we will grow in intimacy with you. That in this time of isolation, that our homes may become a sanctuary for you again. That we may find you in the secret place that this will be a year this will be a time where we grow and grow in intimacy with you and that we're all coming out stronger out of this whole crisis than we went into it lord we invite you take this time take our lives and mold us and shape us in jesus name we pray amen